This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. The Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. We're talking with Scott Roeder of the Evidence Room. I want to talk about some of the evidence of the Daybell trial and uh, just, I mean, how graphic it is. I don't want to go like into the gory details or anything of that nature. But, but the emotional impact that it can have on someone. You're someone who, uh, you know, you see this stuff on a regular basis. This is what you do for a living. So I understand, you know, there's a level of immunity to it once you, you do uh, it, it for so long. But, Scott, I, I want to get your insight, your input on this. Lori, the other day, uh, not wanting to go back into court in the afternoon, uh, saying the uh, essentially uh, the impact that the evidence that was being presented was too great. Uh, obviously, the judge said you need to stay. Uh, it doesn't matter that you may be feeling uh, hurt by all of this. Uh, you say this stuff on a daily basis. Is this a valid argument for someone to say, you know, yes, these are my kids. Yes, she's being charged with murdering them. But again, innocent until proven guilty. Uh, is it a valid uh, point to, to make or an understanding to, uh, to consider of someone really not uh, being capable or wanting to, to be there when that sort of information is presented? Well, no, I don't think she has a choice in that. I think she has to be in the courtroom for that. Um, you know, when you're charged with a crime, uh, you have uh, the right to face your evidence, and I think you have the duty. Uh, and I feel like you can also be compelled to face that evidence. Um, you know, she has the option of pleading guilty, and then she doesn't have to see that evidence, but she might have to see that evidence in the, in the sentencing phase. Uh, I think they ruled that this case is no longer eligible for the death penalty. Yep. Um, but, you know, Tony, here's the thing on, on this case. At one point, in the process of uh, her being prosecuted, she was ruled incompetent. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and then she was ruled competent. I don't know if that's some kind of a ploy or whatnot, yeah. but if you look at the broad spectrum of what's going on in this case, um, we've got mental illness, we've got manipulation, we've got illusions of grandeur, we've got end of the world uh, fantasies and, and so on. Um, I don't know if we can apply the standard of you, Tony, and me, Scott, and, you know, uh, anybody out there doing our day-to-day -day regular normal life, you know, where we're not planning the end of the world. We're, you know, planning supper, right? Yeah. Uh, we're planning Easter or something like that. We're not planning the end of the world. We don't know how things are going through her head. But um, I think the most compelling thing on this case that really incriminates her is that she went you know, she was found in Hawaii, you know, while there was an investigation of her kids being killed. She's you know, clearly been implicated in this case. I think this is really going to come down to um, uh, whether or not I think her her claim is going to be that she was a victim of her boyfriend, mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. he manipulated her, that he was the the mastermind. He was the Charles Manson, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, she was the the, the victim, you know, in this case, but, you know, listen, people are responsible for what they do. Um, we've got two dead kids here and it didn't look like there was any remorse, uh, by them. In fact, they were on vacation, uh, when the bodies were found. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think she has a whole lot of say whether or not she has to be exposed to those photographs. Mm -hmm. I think that she's going to have to sit there and take it. It was interesting, some of the language that was used in court, uh, Judge Stephen Boyce even citing some case law, stating that uh, in the terms I thought were very, uh, very stark, uh, in some cases, they can be gagged and bound, if need be, uh, to be present uh, at their trial if they're deemed competent. Uh, I don't know about if, that. <laughs> if, they're, if, they're, if they're trying to be uh, you know, disruptive or something of that nature. Uh, that's that was the that was the literal language that was used in court yesterday. Yeah, uh, and it was reference to what the court has the ability to do. I can't imagine that happening, but also most of this case you can't imagine happening either. So I mean, yeah. I, I don't no. I don't think we're gonna go that far with with Lori and have her gagged and bound in the courtroom. Um, but it is, it's troubling to me that already on day two, these sort of antics are being pulled and, and I don't know what to make of it because it's, it's always impossible to read Lori Daybell. Is, is this someone who is, uh, you know, as smart as a Fox and she knows what she's doing. This is part of her plan of once it gets difficult, I'm just going to drag my feet and act like a child and disrupt the court. So 
maybe they'll deem me incompetent again. Maybe something will happen. Um, uh, or is this genuine emotion? Uh, we haven't seen her be emotional at all on any of this before. Uh, it's been very much, yeah, I know something you don't know and everything is fine and dandy. Yeah. Uh, so how and why yesterday suddenly she was feeling this emotion and crying and upset. Um, I think the rest of us may read it and go, oh, it's because there's images of your dead children on screen. However, everything in Lori's mind seems to go through Lori's prism, and we don't know what the hell that prism is. Yeah, Tony, I think you hit the nail right on the head here. We're dealing with um, a very unique situation. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it's happened before. You know, people have killed their children before because they think the world is ending. I mean, you know, you, you just have to go back to the, you know, those people that the Haley's, Haley's Comet people that mm-hmm. all drank suicide and, and so on because they wanted to jump on a comet that was flying by. Yeah. And that was before TikTok and the UFOs, Tony. <laughs> yeah, it was okay, heaven so state. <laughs> now we've got this, <laughs> so now we've got this whole mass influence of, uh, you know, the world is falling apart, Tony. And I, I think that, uh, she is a representation of the extreme when you take in all of what this world has to offer that doesn't involve uh, love, uh, charity, uh, compassion, and empathy. And, and when you just listen to the narcissism and the, uh, the negative and uh, those things, and you combine that with a baseline of mental illness and manipulation uh, from a, uh, you know, uh, this this caricature of of this boyfriend uh, who's going to have his own trial, uh, mm-hmm. who is probably going to be eligible for the death penalty, possibly. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're looking at uh, just something that I can't comprehend. I think I can understand how somebody can be so insane, and whether she's insane or not, maybe she comes in and out of sanity. You know, maybe she's you know she can kind of flow in and out. Maybe it's a multiple personalities. I don't think she's competent, Tony. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody that kills her children are competent. Does that mean that they don't deserve penalty? No. Uh, You know, should she be put in jail for the rest of her life if she's found guilty? Absolutely. Should we have sympathy for her? Maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I don't want to hate on anybody, uh, even, you know, because we don't know people's lives. Uh, But I mean, this person strikes me as somebody who's really struggling to stay in base reality here on planet earth. I've been saying that from day one and I've been asking many people, do you think she's going to make it through this whole trial? Because even before it started, I said, I don't know that she's going to, I think at some point something's going to happen. Some sort of evidence is going to come out. It's going to take her into a tailspin and she's not going to be able to actively participate in her own defense, which you need to be able to do to be competent in your trial. Uh, and, right. and, I, and I'm right. really starting, I mean, day two already. We, we're starting to see cracks in this. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll leave on this note and ask, I'll ask you, as I've been asking so many, uh, do you think we're going to see a conclusion to this trial with a verdict or is this going to be ending up in some sort of a mistrial or a delay or a retrial because she can't, she, she's not going to be capable of continuing forward? Yeah, well, I think that's going to be all dependent on the judge. If the judge is going to stick to his guns and and force her, if he has to bound and gag her <laughs> to get a verdict, they're gonna get a verdict on this case, right? Yeah. It, now the real question is, are they gonna have an appealable error to have a retrial or a sentence modification? Uh, the answer is probably uh, yeah. because this is so unusual. Um, you know, how do you, as a jury member, evaluate the culpability of somebody sitting there? Uh, when everything that she's done in the last 20 years or 15 years is just so beyond the pale of Norman, hu- normal human behavior, uh, I, you know, you know, these are not questions of evidence anymore that we're talking about here. We're talking about questions of, you know, how do you determine, you know, maybe the prosecution has that. Maybe the prosecution has written evidence of knowledge of what she's done without guilt or with guilt. Or, or something like that. Um, and if she was a true doomsdayer and she killed those kids, why didn't she kill herself? Uh, so, um, you know, I think that uh, it's, 
it's a, it's a sad, sad uh, representation of, 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 of the most extreme parts of our society affecting a woman and her family in the most negative way. And, and I just feel sorry for everybody involved. And, um, you know, I, I wish peace be upon their souls. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. That it is. And Scott Rudder, who's been with us, he's got a podcast called Crime Scene Time Machine. What you got going on over there, Scott? Well, over at Crime Scene Time Machine, a uh, podcast on uh, Spotify and soon coming to all platforms. Uh, we put out a real light episode uh, this past week after handling Bobby Kennedy's assassination and the Jeffrey Epstein murder. Uh, we put out a fun podcast this week just for easy listening about the movie A Few Good Men. We break down the crime inside the movie A Few Good Men, have a few laughs, and uh, learn a little bit about trial law uh, circa 1995. Check that out. You can follow me on Twitter at Tony B Pod. I'm Tony Bruski. Stay with us. 